Good evening, everyone. Thanks very much for your patience as we were setting up there. And you're very welcome to the TASC Annual Lecture of 2013. My name's Nat O'Connor, and I'm the director of TASC, Think Tank for Action on Social Change. And we're delighted that so many people wanted to be here tonight. Uh, we had to run a waiting list at one point, but I think we were able to accommodate everybody in the end. And thanks for, for squeezing in and making room. So there's a lot of familiar faces here tonight, but some new faces as well. So I think it's important for me to say a little bit about what TASC is and what we do. But before I do that, just a bit of housekeeping. In the unlikely event of an emergency, we have the fire exit here on this side and the door that you came in there at the back as well. Could you please take a moment to check your mobile phones and to turn them off or to turn them onto silent, please? And the, the schedule for tonight is as follows. I'm going to speak to you just briefly for about 10 minutes about TASC and about the rationale for this annual lecture. And then I'm going to introduce our guest lecturer, uh, Ellen O'Malley Dunlop, the CEO of the Dublin Rape Crisis Centre. I will address you for about 45, 50 minutes. We have a little bit of time at the end for questions and comments and discussion. And then there'll be a, a glass of wine in the front rooms. So as you go out towards the front door, there's a set of rooms and uh, there'll be someone there to guide you into a glass of wine and to some copies there of task publications as well. And we're asked to leave the building by about half past nine, but I'd say we'd be running out of wine at that stage anyway. So for those of you who don't know task, our byline is independent research, challenging inequality, and promoting a flourishing society. And independent research is the foundation of our work as a think tank. We promote evidence-based policy making. So not the policy-based evidence making, which is when uh, consultants' reports say exactly what politicians or officials want them to say. Um, we're very careful to stay independent. We don't receive any public funding and we don't accept funding that would damage our independence. So we're a non-profit uh, public education charity. We do receive funding from philanthropists, from donations and from some commissioned work to support our mission. So at this point, it's my duty as a CEO to be crass for a moment and to point out that the envelope on your seat is, is for you. Um, if you'd like to make a donation towards tonight's costs and towards our work, I know some people very kindly made a donation on their way in, but that's much appreciated. And likewise, on our website, you can find out ways of supporting and getting involved in what we do. Organisations like TASC and the Dublin Rape Crisis Centre, of course, need uh, private support to help us do what we do uh, in civil society. The second part of TASC's byline is challenging inequality. And we're particularly concerned with the global trend over recent decades of increasing levels of income inequality, wealth inequality, and substantive differences in the educational and health outcomes of different socioeconomic groups. It's not only leading to social problems and poverty, but it's also causing dysfunction right across Western economies. I'll give you three quick examples. Last month, the respected Yale uh, professor, Robert Schiller, jointly won the Nobel Memorial Prize for Economics. And in his response to receiving the prize, he said, the most important problem that we are facing today is rising inequality in the United States and elsewhere in the world. And just to give you some, some figures, in the USA, the top 1% now own 35% of US wealth, whereas the bottom half of society own just 2.5% of wealth. Just to give you an idea of the disparity that has grown. In Ireland, another example, the task report on health inequalities of 2011 pointed at CSO data here, which shows that men born in the, the bottom 20% in terms of uh, deprived areas will live on average for four and a half years less than men born in the top 20%. And another example, in 1986, the year that the Combat Poverty Agency was founded in Ireland, uh, to grapple with a crisis that had been ongoing for years, there was 232,000 people unemployed and 28,000 were emigrating every year. This was seen as a crisis. From April last year to April this year, 89,000 people emigrated from Ireland. And today there's over 300,000 unemployed. Of course, the Combat Poverty Agency was dismantled in 2009. There is a major risk that as our economy slowly recovers, we will leave behind tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people, of families, in long-term unemployment, and it's what's known as structural unemployment. 
where people's skills are lost, where they lose motivation, and where it becomes increasingly hard to bring them back into the world of regular work. Material deprivation in Ireland has more than doubled. 18.8% in 2007, 24.5% in 2011. That means that a quarter of Irish households, including many people at work, can't afford to heat their homes adequately, can't always put meat on the table every second day in terms of meals, or are affected by similar indicators of material deprivation. So economic inequality is a national problem and it affects all of us. Which brings me to Task's role in promoting a flourishing society. The annual lecture is part of Task's contribution to a vision of Ireland as a flourishing society in which no section of society is left behind and no social problem is left unacknowledged. We produced a series of essays on the theme of a flourishing society launched by President Michael D. Higgins in this room very eloquently in June last year and there's copies available outside as well as our other publications. And the essays are part of our contribution to the debate about national renewal and the need for new ideas about where we're going as a country. Because it's not just about what went wrong during the bust, it's also about the things that were wrong during the height of the boom. Ireland is now post bailout. We're post the Regling and Watson report on our banks. We're post the Mahan investigation of corruption. We're post Murphy and post Ryan in terms of acknowledging sexual abuse, institutional child abuse, and the cover-up of that abuse. And there are more examples. And all of these reports are very important. It's necessary and valuable that we acknowledge the truth of what happened. We acknowledge those who have suffered and we document it for future generations. But do we have a national capacity to learn from the past? Facing up to institutional failings, whether they're cover-ups, lack of regulation, lack of investigation, as well as individual wrongdoing, require deep institutional change. It also requires social change and change in people's attitudes. But we can't build a brighter future on negatives. We have to have a positive vision of the kind of society we want for ourselves, for our children, and for everyone else's children in this country. We have to recognize the social harm from losing hundreds of thousands of jobs in our economy and from pay cuts and cutbacks in services affecting many more people. So when I'm talking to foreign journalists or to staff at the, the embassies here, many people ask me why the Irish are not protesting. They also ask me about the risks to social cohesion in Ireland. It's one of their top questions. There's a lot of factors there, but one thing is that our national culture values privacy and personal reputation, which is no bad thing. But there's a risk that this has turned negative into secrecy, into secret shame, into depression, into isolation of many people, particularly those who are unemployed, which turns into bottled up frustration, which is a major risk to society. Some economists will talk about social scarring, but they won't go into details. They talk about externalities, things they can't measure in economic models, and they leave it to other professions and move on. Talk about forecast growth and employment rates, ignoring the, the reality of the people who are uh, afflicted. Economics without social policy is like law without justice. So the human cost and the social cost of the economic collapse is immeasurable harm. And the economic cost and the cost to the public finances is substantial. Tonight, we're focusing on an issue that I believe has not received enough attention, which is the risk of domestic abuse and violence, especially violence against women, as a result of the social scarring from the economic collapse and the explosion of unemployment. And aptly, we're in the 16 days of the UN uh, program for campaigning against and preventing violence against women, which started on Monday. And we know that one result from high unemployment, poverty and deprivation, is a rise in domestic abuse and violence, including sexual violence. Good data there, research, strong correlations. Such the title of this year's annual lecture is very appropriate. The incidence of domestic abuse and sexual violence is high in Ireland. In the mid-90s, in one report, one in five women in a relationship suffered abuse from a current or former partner. And there's a litany of intolerable facts and statistics 
recording abuse and violence, and of course much is not recorded or reported. But I'm sure Ellen will remind you of those facts. And tonight, today, while not the only factor involved, high unemployment over a long period risks higher levels of domestic abuse and violence occurring, which calls for preventative action. At the same time, we know that socioeconomic variables are only part of a more complex picture. Sexual abuse and violence can and do happen right across society, among the middle classes, among the wealthy and powerful. We can't ignore the psychological aspects of violence, its criminality, and the personal responsibility involved. What we're talking about are complex social problems, wicked problems in social science, due to the number of variables involved. And the Australian Public Service Commission has written about wicked problems. They say the traditional policy thinking suggests that the best way to work through a problem is in an orderly and linear process from problem to solution. But the consensus in the literature for complex social problems is that this traditional approach is inadequate. We need to have a holistic rather than linear thinking, thinking capable of grasping the bigger picture and seeing the interrelationships between a full range of causal factors and objectives. Arguably, Irish public policy is still very much in the linear way of working. Too, many, too much policy done in silos, too many barriers to effective cross-departmental implementation of strategies and to implementing agreed recommendations from reports. And in particular, there's often reluctance to include economic equality or inequality as one of the causal factors in social problems. But we do need to reduce economic inequality and poverty and deprivation as part of the solution to domestic abuse and violence against women. That's task's role to communicate our analysis and proposals about economic inequality. The Dublin Rape Crisis Centre is at the coal face in addressing the needs of women who experience rape and other sexual assault. They do excellent work providing legal advice, financial advice, other supports that are needed, as well, of course, as personal counselling. But you don't meet, need me to tell you about that because no better person than Ellen O'Malley Dumbloff here tonight to talk about these issues. Ellen was appointed CEO of the Dublin Rape Crisis Centre in May 2006. Since then, she's also worked on implementing the recommendations of the Savvy Report from 2002, a sexual abuse and violence in Ireland report. So she's well experienced in all the challenges of implementing uh, national report recommendations. Ellen has also served as a member of the task force for the Child and Family Support Agency, the Department of Children and Youth Affairs, and worked on their report to the Minister in July of 2012. She was a member of the board of the National Women's Council of Ireland for five years, and she's a psychothera psychotherapist and group analyst by profession. She was formerly chairperson of the Irish Council of Psychotherapy, and she was a founder member and director of the Irish Institute for Psychoanalytic Psychotherapy. She also has interests in Irish culture and our heritage, and she's very well qualified to talk about the challenges of envisaging a flourishing society and a stronger, more successful national effort to eliminate violence against women. So please join me in welcoming the guest lecturer of 2013, Ms Ellen O'Malley Dunlop. Anna had called the helpline many times, but she hung up as soon as she, a person came on the line. However, however, this time she found her voice. Anna has two young children, a three-year-old and a small baby. She says the little fellow was a bit of a surprise. Well, more than a bit. The baby's unplanned arrival means she can't look for work. They can hardly pay the rent, let alone afford childcare. Her partner's hours have been cut twice in the last 18 months. They are now eligible for family income supplement but finding the time to sit down and work through the 16-page document is difficult. Her partner won't do it, nor will he look after the boys when he comes home from work so that she can do it. He gets irritable whenever she mentions their need to apply for extra financial support. Anna describes how difficult her relationship has become and how money-centred it is now. She feels her partner blames her for becoming pregnant with their second child. If they only had one child, maybe her, her mother would have been able to mind her son and she would have been able to continue to work. Her partner is now angry all the time. A couple of times in the last few months, she was not in the humour for making love. 
but she felt she should. Sure, isn't that just the way it is sometimes between couples? The rhetorical question hangs there for a moment. Then she talks about the night he came home, having been told for the second time that his hours were cut, and he forced her to have sex. She was devastated. Afterwards, she just lay there, wondering how the man she loved could treat her so despicably, no matter how annoyed, angry or frustrated he was. She tried to talk to him, but he accused her of being hysterical. The following day, the bruises around her neck showed up where he tried to strangle her. Bruises and bite marks on her breasts and inside legs. She tried again to speak to him, and he accused her of being neurotic and said, sure, that's what happens when you want to grow up. She then goes on to say that if a friend of hers told her the story that she had just recounted, she would have been the first to say, get out of there and report him to the Gardaí for rape. But who would believe her? He is her partner, the father of her children. The telephone counsellor at the Dublin Rape Crisis Centre helpline that this woman spoke to, spoke to her about the help and support of agencies like the Rape Crisis Centre and Women's Aid and what they can offer. But her sense was that this young woman just needed to be heard and not judged for her decision to, re to remain where she was for now. Four in ten women in Ireland are victims of sexual violence. That is the stark reality I am here to speak about this evening. Rampant violence against women is a reality Ireland urgently needs to address. And I thank TASC for the opportunity to put it on the agenda. Violence against women, is, of course, is not just an Irish problem. The UN reports that globally one in three women will be beaten, coerced into sex or otherwise abused at some point in their life. The UN further notes that violence against women is not particular to any region or country or to particular groups of women within a society and states that the roots of this violence can be found in unequal power relations between men and women and in persistent discrimination against women. These global figures include data from countries at war or recovering from war. In such situations, sexual violence is frequently used as a deliberate weapon to terrorise and control civilian populations in direct contravention of the UN Security Council Resolution 1325. Violence against women in Ireland occurs in many forms, domestic and sexual violence, including rape and sexual assault, prostitution and trafficking, among others. Violence against women is mostly perpetrated by men. It is not restricted to any particular class or creed. Neither, neither are the perpetrators limited by class or creed. And as I said, the roots of this violence are in unequal power relations between men and women, and this inequality is evident across all classes, sectors and geographic locations in Irish society. The, sus the sustained scale, depth and severity of violence against women and children we see in Ireland represent an abuse of human rights. In fact, gender-based violence represents one of the most serious violations of women's rights in Ireland today. So let's be clear, human rights abuses are not just something that happen overseas in the context of war, civil conflicts or at the whim of dictators. Most of the violence against women in Ireland occur in homes and in communities and at the hands of people near to them, not at the hands of menacing strangers. Every day of every week in Ireland, women are punched, slapped, stabbed, beaten, raped and sexually assaulted, not to mention suffering verbal, emotional and financial abuse and other degrading treatments. Violent behaviour is learned. There's nobody born violent. And it's used as a way of managing and controlling relationships. What we have is an epidemic of violence, a significant public health crisis, a systemic issue with deep roots. 
In some deep way and for some deep reason, the makeup and processes of our society, as we have organized it, lead to this violence against women. And in some deep way, for some deep reason, by us not railing against this terrible burden of violence, by our accepting its existence, its inevitability, year after year, we are saying as a people, this is part of our makeup, this is part of who we are. If that sits uncomfortably with you, with me, then we are challenged to do something about it, not to simply hope it will go away. From 25 years working as a psychotherapist, I would suggest that first and foremost, we need to reflect carefully on the issue, to acknowledge, identify and wrestle with the underlying problems before we can move forward with tack tackling it honestly and effectively. We need the hard facts, the trends, the locations and circumstances in which violence against women and children happen in order to really understand it. Then as a society, we need to tackle this social scourge. Nash referred to some of the statistics and I'll just add a few more. In one in seven women in Ireland experience domestic violence. One in five women have experienced sexual assault in adulthood. In 2012, over 14,000 incidents of domestic violence were disclosed to the Women's Aid National Helpline. In 2011, Ruhama supported 240 women affected by prostitution. Of the 557 clients seen by the Dublin Rape, Cran Rape Crisis Centre Counselling Service, 88% were women. On one day in November last year, 537 women and 316 children were given refuge or received other support from a domestic violence service in Ireland. That is the equivalent of the Savoy Cinema on O'Connell Street at capacity. In 2012, over 3,000 incidents of child abuse were disclosed to the Women, Women's Aid Helpline. On average, 1,000 women are available for sale on any given day in Ireland. The vast majority are migrant women and girls who are particularly vulnerable. Since 1996, 194 women were murdered. Of the 142 cases where the perpetrator was known, 75 women were killed by their partner or ex-partner. In 2011, there were over 28,000 helpline contacts to rape crisis centres across the country. When the helpline was set up in 1979, there were 78 calls. These are just some of the facts of the epidemic of violence against women in today's Ireland. What about the economic costs, since we're here with task? In addition to causing physical injury or sometimes death, Violence against women is a major cause of ill health from the multiple mental, physical, sexual and reproductive health problems that can result. Violence against women is also linked with alcohol and drug use, smoking and unsafe sex. In addition to the appalling human cost, research shows violence against women and children has huge economic costs to health, legal, police and other services. And in 2005, a study on violence against women for the United Nations found that when calculated over 13 countries and included were the United States and the United Kingdom, this cost amounted to $50 billion per year. In Ireland, the economic cost of domestic violence, and that's just one facet of violence against women and affecting children, it's estimated at $2.2 billion a year. The broad social costs are profound, including constraints on women's participation in employment and access to education, along with children's education and well-being in affected families, all of which have considerable knock-on effects in later life. No research can quantify the debilitating social cost, which is a hollowing out of the physical, mental and psychic health of our society. 
A big part of the cost of violence against women and children is borne by the survivors and their families. Born in silence and in secrecy, because this enormous problem is virtually invisible in society. Apart from the sporadic outbreaks of outrage around particular inc incidents or official reports, such as Nat referred to the Ryan, the Murphy, Cloyne, or the Roscommon case, or the report on deaths of, in childcare, what can we do about it? Tackling the violence against women and children in our society requires laws and policies that promote and protect the human rights of women. It requires strategies to empower women financially and personally to equalise the imbalances of power in their relations with men. In addition, tackling violence against women and children requires early childhood interventions revisiting the way we educate our citizens and challenging the social values and norms that perpetuate this violence. And I think a very positive step is having a full Minister for Children and Youth Affairs and the setting up of the Child and Family Agency with its emphasis on, early, on, on, uh, its emphasis on child protection, early intervention and prevention policies. After analysing the full range of available international literature on the economic costs of violence against women, and I referred to the 2005 research earlier, the UN reported and said the following. Because the costs of violence against women are so widespread throughout the society, throughout the whole of society, it is always the case that a small amount of money spent on effective programmes will lead to a much larger saving in total cost in the future. Now, I think that's worth repeating. Because the costs of violence against women are so widespread throughout a whole society, it is always the case that a small amount of money spent on effective programmes will lead to a much larger saving in the total costs in the future. Yet in Ireland in 2013, we do not address violence against women as a vital social, economic or public health issue. And we struggle to co-finance those organisations which do tackle violence against women on a voluntary basis in, on society's behalf. In 1997, the Task Force on uh, Violence Against Women recommended setting up a National Steering Committee on Violence Against Women with representation from the relevant statutory and NGO agencies who would work together for the elimination of violence against women. And this is very positive. The committee was set up and it was informed by regional committees. And in 2007, CUSC, the government's national office for the prevention of domestic, sexual and gender-based violence was launched. And among its task is devising and implementing the national strategy on domestic, sexual and gender-based violence across all government departments and promoting and supporting public awareness raising campaigns. Its director chairs the National Steering Committee, which met four times up to 2013. But since the economic downturn, these meetings have been cut to twice yearly and all the regional committees have been suspended apart from one. There is a great danger that the good work underway since the setting up of the steering committee is being slowly but surely eroded. At a wider and even more problematic level, when unequal power relations are both a cause and consequence of this violence against women, Ursula Barry and Pauline Conroy have pointed out in a task analysis how policies and organisations promoting gender equality have been hit since the recession and with the recent crisis management of the Irish economy. From all the evidence, cutting the meagre statutory funding that helps support these essential services is a short-sighted and cowardly false economy. Now I'd like to take a little break and look at the past and see if we can learn from the past. Over the years, I have done a lot of work on exploring Irish myths and folklore and considering their contemporary relevance, mainly through the Bard Summer School, which takes place on Clare Island, County Mayo, and the summer school is now in its 18th year. The stories, themes and motifs in our old stories have lasted the test of time. 
they've been passed on through generations in the oral tradition before they were written down. In fact, the Irish myths were written down a thousand years after the Greek myths were committed to paper. Myths were one way the ancients made sense of their world. Our myths, legends and folklore did not survive just by accident. They clearly speak to us and inform our sense of ourselves and our worldview in some deep way. Exploring these myths and, cre and creatively reinventing them for our time is one way we can draw on a wealth of wisdom and tradition while moving forward to identify, confront and overcome contemporary challenges. The fate of the children of Lear is one of the most abiding and best loved, if also poorly understood, myths from ancient Ireland. Any time we've worked with this particular story in groups, lots of people are attracted to the events. This is a story that has captured the imagination of parents and children, artists, poets, musicians, sculptors, even business entrepreneurs. Think of Oshin Kelly's Children of Lear sculpture in, sculpture in the Garden of Remembrance through to Lear Chocolates, to give just a couple of examples. The story appears all sweetness and light on the surface, but underneath lies a much darker tone. In a simmering tale of thwarted ambition, politically motivated matchmaking, a loveless marriage, <clears throat> deep resentment of the children from another relationship, and the tragic abuse of power, Aoife resolves to kill the four children of King Lear. Failing in that ambition, she turns them into swans and curses them to spend 300 years each on Lake Derivara, the Sea of Moyle, and the Western Ocean. After 900 years, they return to human form. Old and wizened, they are baptised by the monk Macquaybog before dying and being buried on Inishloira. Working through this story with many groups over the years, I have seen their surprise at the dark interpretations arising from what they had assumed to be a gentle childhood story. Examining the myth in depth brought observations on the unequal power relations, the use and abuse of power, the lack of respect for women, and an enforced silence in the face of the terrible suffering that the victimised and virtually invisible children went through. We know from anthropologists that the way people listen to stories is always in terms of their contemporary realities. The oral tradition is always about the here and now. Our group analysis of the children of Lear brought troubling associations with modern Irish history, with the treatment of women and children in Magdalene laundries and industrial schools, dreadful abuses of power held over women and children, and the terrible effects that can arise or rather that have arisen and still arise when society's checks and balances are not fit for purpose. One lesson that I take strongly from the children of Lear and which my experience as a teacher reinforced at an early age is the need to stop and listen carefully to our children. This means talking less and listening more, respecting what children and young people have to say and taking your lead as to how you act as an adult from where the children are at and for what is best for the child. We also need to equip our young people to think for themselves, to communicate effectively and to respect their rights and responsibilities in balance with those of others. We have many other ancient myths that are not nearly as prominent in our collective consciousness as the children of Lear but which could serve us well as deep-lying frames of reference or as an, an idealised social and moral universe. These include, for example, a whole range of stories about kings, sovereignty and the exercise of power. These st stories capture our ancestors' understanding that a blend of wisdom, responsibility and accountability is needed to balance the exercise of power. According to the ancients and to tradition, while Ireland's sovereignty is claimed by the rightful leader or king, when he lies with the goddess, who is the symbol of the land, there will be abundance, the land will flourish, and its people will live in harmony. Among the oldest descriptions of the Irish mythic landscape are the Irish 
sagas or imramas, voyages to other land. The voyagers of old set out without any clear expectation of where they were going, but trusted that they would arrive somewhere. In fact, the very first story in our oldest book on Laragawala, and I'm not sure if it's here, but I'm sure it might be, is the story of the first man and woman to come to Ireland. He was called Fintan, and he was a shaman and a shapeshifter, and was 5,000 years old. She was called Cesar, and was from the Sudan, and had travelled all the known countries of the world before arriving in Ireland. So the first man and woman to arrive in Ireland were not warriors, but two wise people bringing their own unique and, val and valuable experiences to a virgin land. From the 8th century mythic tales recorded by Christian monks of the voyage of Bran to the land of the immortals, we hear that the voyagers received gifts from people they encountered. Bran's gift was a, a silver branch of perception that enabled him to travel to other worlds, to the Isle of Joy, to the Island of Women, for instance, where he learned different perspectives on life from the women he met. If we set sail today with fair heart and an open-ended journey, if we take up the quest to end the plague of violence against women and children, then who knows where it can take us, what allies that we, we will meet or make, and what gifts we will find to light our way. Looking back again, is it any surprise that after the long, dark months of ancient times, the Celts wove wondrous tales of renewal and rebirth, healing and growth around springtime, personified in the goddess Bridget, the elemental healer? Even or especially in times of suffering or deep, tr or deep trouble, the winters of the soul, we all need stories of hope and change as individuals and as a people, stories of healing and rebirth, stories of renewal and growth. Fiona Doyle, a strong and brave survi survivor of horrific sexual abuse through her childhood, has commented how, as an adult, having found my voice, I want to continue to speak out. Speaking out is power. Hearing my story will make it easier for the next person. Telling her story in the deeply moving book, Too Many Tears, was an act of healing for herself and for others. As Fiona describes it, telling her story was a therapeutic act, an act of reclaiming her own self and self-worth, and one she hopes will give other survivors hope for the battle they face in speaking out. At the Dublin Rape Crisis Centre, we see it in our work, the power that telling their story Letting these feelings out to a trusted person can bring to someone who has been raped, assaulted or sexually abused. And over time, the power that shaping and reshaping the narrative of their lives can give back to the survivors of violence uh, and abuse. As long as they are alive, people and peoples have in them the powerful possibility for change. It is well within our compass to change the myth that lies deep beneath and subtly shape our society. I think it is possible, desirable and seriously important to unravel and dispose of the insidious modern myths, and by myth here I mean lies, that if a girl or a woman dresses in a particular way, she is asking for it, that if a person drinks too much, they are asking for it, that no does not mean no if there's been some prior kissing, that rape is about an overactive sex drive. We should wrestle with our founding myths alongside the violent stories of contemporary Irish society, just as Fiona Doyle grappled with her narrative in Too Many Tears, to move forward to a healthier and happier state. So here are some more reflections on the here and now. At the Dublin Rape Crisis Centre, we work on preventing and healing sexual violence within severe financial constraints. One thing we have particularly noted in recent years is the extraordinary level of violence that lies behind the statistics of rape, assault and abuse, for which appear, and they appear to be increasing. What we are talking about here is 
documented evidence of the high levels of additional types of violence experienced by both adult victims of rape and victims of childhood sexual abuse. And these include physical violence, intimidation, psychological abuse, and threats to kill. The incidence of additional, sometimes sadistic, violence is coming through the harrowing experiences of those who are subjected to such crimes. It is also emerging from counsellors and volunteers who provide services to survivors on the front line of this shocking violence. Why are such heinous crimes occurring in our society at this time? What is the meaning of this apparent increase in additional violence being perpetrated along with the rapes, sexual assaults, sexual and physical abuse? We know that easy access to pornography fuels objectification of both women and men, especially among young people who are exposed and whose worldview is still being shaped. Hardcore pornography in particular has a dangerous and damaging effect on people's health and on their lives. It is addictive and as one uh, victim said to us, it can kill a person's soul. Is the availability and use of hardcore and violent pornography leading to lower thresholds of male self-control, higher thresholds in society of acceptable types or levels of violence? Is it not time or beyond time to consider whether the availability and increased social acceptance of pornography is changing our nation's cultural attitudes to women in a, in a damaging way. Unfortunately, in Ireland, we do not have the rigorous, up-to-date, longitudinal research in the area of violence against women, or even the narrower field of sexual violence and abuse that would help shape and guide our policies and our lawmaking. Nat referred to the Savvy Report, Sexual Abuse and Violence in Ireland, which was launched in 2002, and it was a landmark report and the most comprehensive research ever done on the prevalence, attitudes and beliefs to sexual violence in Ireland. It made available data and information for which the first time validated the stories we were hearing in the therapy rooms, in doctor surgeries and in confessionals, the length and breadth of Ireland. It provided research evidence which backed up service providers' experiences of the significant scale of underreporting, with 47% of those who reported abuse in Savvy having never previously told another person. Savvy significantly influenced practice among service providers, as well as enhancing understanding and policy among respons responsible state bodies. But one of the major recommendations has still not been implemented, and that is the recommendation to repeat the survey 10 years on. This evidence base is clearly required so that services for victims, policies and practices, and any legislative or policy changes needed can be appropriately informed. It is a crying shame and a lost opportunity that it has not been possible to undertake this research. Individual organisations' reports using annual and sub-national data give us only fragmented snapshots of the situation. A follow-up to SAVI would give us that bigger picture of the prevalence of sexual violence in Ireland, including any changes in trends or the experience of this violence of those affected over the years. Even within current financial straits, it should, it should not be beyond the ambition and ability of politicians and policymakers across government departments to co-fund a follow-up to SAVI. Research also shows that more equal societies are more politically stable and have less violence and crime. We also know that social protection against blatant violence and prohibitions against inhumane or degrading treatment are among the minimum standards of basic human equality. Yet in the past few years, we have rising inequality alongside the dismantling or neutering of the agencies which were tasked with making inroads in promoting equality, including gender equality. 
So if we see increased inequality and less momentum towards promoting equality, while knowing that gender inequality lives cheek by jowl with structural violence against women, we may be creating the enabling conditions for even more violence. At the moment, the country is on a high state of alert about the state of the economy, and that is warranted. But we see nothing like the level of alarm and national abate, uh, debate that is warranted from politicians, policymakers, or the public itself about violence against women, or the levels of social inequality, including gender equality, that lie behind it. This violence against women is a societal crisis, just as surely as the public finances are in crisis. It is a public health crisis in itself, a crisis for individuals on the receiving end of violence and for their families, and a barely vis visible, slow-burning economic crisis. It also reveals a deep and wide social chasm, a society tearing itself apart deep down, almost silently, and scarcely even understanding why. In the first instance, we need to raise awareness. Violence against women and children are extremely difficult crimes to stop, partly because of their very nature. These crimes usually take place behind closed doors, often indeed in the home. They disempower their victims. They are difficult to talk about to family, service providers, or the authorities, and they can be difficult to prove in law. We know from Savvy the report that awareness raising is one of the best ways of encouraging people who have been affected to come forward and to seek the help that is available. Even if those affected do not, affected do not want to report the crime to the Garda Síochána, they can get the help that is needed to come through the trauma they have suffered. And the Cusk Office have, over the last five years, supported a national awareness raising campaign on an annual basis that has been run by the Dublin Rape Crisis Centre. And we believe that this is uh, very worthy and we hope it continues. Each time a crisis or very tragic and public case arises, such as the publication of the many reports referred to earlier, the Rape Crisis Centre and other frontline agencies see a spike in the numbers of people contacting support services. We tend to to also see a spike in public interest, even alarm, and in political intention to do something. Before we can bring an end to violence against women and children, we need to be clear as to the current scale and nature of the problem, as well as to be able, as individuals and as a society, to talk about this publicly, openly and soberly, not just in an alarmist or emotive terms in light of dreadful individual cases. There have been many brave and courageous women over the years who waived their right to anonymity to speak out of, uh, for the greater good. Like Lavinia Corwick, I don't know if some of you may have remembered her, she spoke out about an unjust suspended sentence that the perpetrator of rape against her had received. It was, it was this that forced the change in the law which enabled other victims of lenient sentences to have their cases sent by the DPP to the Court of Criminal Appeal. But we should not rely on vulnerable survivors finding the courage to speak out publicly in order to bring about the changes that are needed in society. Some of the matters on which we would like to raise awareness and bring about change are system level uh, challenges, often legacy issues from a different time with different norms and values that can increase the suffering of those people affected by violence or contribute to high rates of impunity for the perpetrators of violence. Savvy told us that only one in 10 report the crime, and of that one in 10, only 7% get to court. We have seen some progress in Ireland in courtroom procedures that protect the privacy of victims during trial, such, such as restricting access to courtroom during rape trials and the victim's complainant's entitlement to separate legal representation if the defence wants to cross-examine them on their past sexual history. Our Minister for Justice, Alan Shatter, was a member of the European group that brought forward the Victims' Rights Directive that Ireland has now signed up to and which has to be committed to law by the end of 2015. 
This is a very positive step forward to addressing the huge imbalance in treatment between the rights of the accused and of the victim in the criminal justice system. It will hopefully go a long way to ensuring that more victims will be able to stay the course of the court process. Currently, Ireland has the highest attrition rate among 11 European countries between reporting the crime of rape and getting to court. The appointment of women to the roles of Director of Public Prosecutions, Attorney General, Chief Justice and State Solicitor has also improved things, bringing a new energy, sensibility and collaborative spirit to a number of initiatives and mechanisms that help us to tackle violence against women. It would be a great advance to have specialist courts, judges and lawyers undertaking specialist and continuing education and training in order to improve the process and outcomes for everyone involved in sexual offences cases. These are just a couple of examples of system issues we need to address in order to increase convictions and end impunity for these crimes. It is not enough to demonstrate outrage at the crime or to vilify the violent criminal. We need to be serious as a society in tackling root causes if we are to end violence. At the Dublin Rape Crisis Centre, we work with the victims of crime and of rape and sexual violence, but we believe that all forms of violence against women needs to be tackled in a coherent way, and that is why we work closely with a range of partners towards the elimination of all forms of violence against women. We're a member of the National Steering Committee on Violence Against Women, the National Observatory on Violence Against Women, the uh, Turn Off the Red Light campaign, Children's Rights Alliance, just to name but a few. It is vital to all of us that Ireland should make clear and continuous progress on implementing the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, to which we acceded as a country in 1985. This convention provides a critical tool for driving the norms and standards and the legislation where required for enhanced gender equality, because it is greater equality that will help even up power relations between men and women, between adults and children, and thereby get at the root causes of this structural violence. Ireland should also urgently ratify and quickly implement key provisions of the Council of Europe's Istanbul Convention on Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence, because this also provides valuable opportunities to make progress. So, can we envision a way forward? I think we can. Having looked at how we need to gaze clearly and coldly at the present, and how we may learn from the past. Let me share a few thoughts as to how we might move forward. In the short term, while always working towards prevention, we must at the very least ensure that appropriate services are provided to respond to the rights and needs of victims. The services required to deal with violence against women are many and varied from providing refuge, health and counselling services to education and public awareness raising. With regard to sexual violence, for instance, we must protect the excellent services of the country's rape crisis centres and the sexual assault treatment units, who provide vital and underfunded emotional and psychological support to those affected by such violence. International research and experience point to some of the other successful means to work on eliminating violence against women. And they include increased analysis and understanding, documenting the financial and economic costs, which will hopefully win political support for change, and directly encouraging behaviour change around gender norms and behaviours. Other successful approaches cited by the UN include community-based protection, empowering women and children, engaging men to tackle the problem, effective laws and public policies, and encouraging communities and governments to meet standards to reduce gender-based violence. So there are useful strategies, but drawing on 25 years of experience as a psychotherapist, I am convinced that there is 
nothing to suggest that we can forego the national conversation. The broad and serious reflection required to access where we stand, why we find ourselves here, and how we want to move forward. We must reflect on the situation that exists, a social crisis, but one that has not been adequately identified as such, in order to propose, implement, and evaluate multiple solutions that allow for healing, renewal, and growth. In this soul-searching, if you will, Ireland urgently needs to reflect on the values, social structures and relations, as well as the failures of responsibility and accountability which have brought us to this place. I'm going to go back to the ancients, to the Firbolgs, one of the many groups of invaders who arrived in Ireland. And we, perhaps we can learn from the sublime social political concept that they brought to us, the concept of the fifth province. Let's imagine how, at a time of warring kingdoms and fiefdoms, the Firbolgs established a major annual gathering at Ishnach, where day-to-day -day interests, rivalries and fightings were set aside, and people of all tribes came together for a festival of song, stories and shared reflection. During this gathering, ordinary time was suspended, and for a set period, old wounds were tended to, conflicts were mediated, songs were songs and so stories told. There was food and drink in abundance, and the peoples of Ireland had the experience of being together without the pressures of defending their narrow interests. Afterwards, they returned to their own territories with the experiences and insights gained from this time outside time in the fifth province. Maybe we could create a modern fifth province experience, a transitional space where we can address the problem I am addressing here this evening. This might be a type of national forum to tackle violence against women, complete with a temporary cessation of violence. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? To allow all interest groups, community and government actors to come together, set their narrow interests temporarily aside and seriously consider how it is we have found ourselves in such a crisis. With expert facilitation, we might vision where we would like to stand as a people and plan for the practical ways in which we can move forward. A high-profile for forum would help in the first place to build recognition of the scale and impact of the problem, establish it as a political and social priority, attract policymakers, media and public attention, establishing the epidemic, the epidemic of violence as a topic of national discourse, and bring together different interest groups to create a momentum for change. But I am not talking of a once-off event or conference when I call for a process of reflection. Such a once-off event would help light a spark, be a catalyst, create a momentum for change. But there needs to be considerable follow-up and follow-through on the laws, policies and processes, as well as the social norms and behaviours needed to bring about the required change. This could involve a rolling programme of expert work extensive consultation along the lines of the Convention of the Constitution, maybe, together with widespread serious discussion of the symptoms, underlying condition, diagnosis and treatment at interpersonal, community, media and societal levels. Following on from this, we could build a movement for change, a peaceful coalition of the willing, to draw on different talents, gifts and energies, and to take us from this violent place. And looking to the future, we need to strive for equality of condition, elim eliminating major inequalities over time while greatly reducing the current scale of inequality in a whole range of ways. This involves creating a society in which men and women are equal to each other in economic, political, cultural, family and social relations. Education is one of our powerful tools, and we must ensure that our education does not embody 
and perpetuate inequality. Through education of individual citizens, communities and societies as a whole, we can empower ourselves to understand and overcome the abuse of power that is at the root of violence against women, including rape and sexual abuse. It is imperative that resources are put into education through programmes such as the Stay Safe programme in primary schools and the SPHE programme in secondary schools to ensure that our children receive appropriate age-related information on sexual matters and relationships. This education will help children protect their own health and bodily integrity, but also that of their peers, friends, brothers and sisters as they go through life. The education I speak of would also involve processes like awareness raising, relationship and conflict resolution skills, anger management and outreach to men in order to bring about changes to the values, culture and behaviours that bring about and tolerate this violence. As a society, we need to invest in education about our bodies and relationships and our, about our rights and responsibilities as human beings and as citizens in order to empower and equip people, especially young people, to resist the abuse of power. Furthermore, we need to build critical thinking on civil, social, economic and political matters to allow for critique of the way things are and the way things are done to help people, especially young people, look beneath the surface at the underlying nature of things. And we need to foster the wisdom and skills needed to creatively draw on our past, to revitalize our values and common purpose, and to vision and build our future as a people and as a nation. Hard pragmatism may be required, and doing more with less may be the mantra of the moment. But even in these dark, violent days, we have got to dream of the stars. At the Dublin Rape Crisis Centre, even as we seek to protect basic services for those who need them and continue raising awareness of the scourge of rape and sexual violence and the wider structural violence against women, we also dare to dream. And we need to be able to dream, to dream a better world, a kinder world, a more compassionate world, to dream an Ireland that can come through and out of this current crisis into an Ireland that claims its true sovereignty, not just economic sovereignty, but a sovereignty of land, spirit and soul, of equality between men and women. We dream of a day when Ireland citizens will have the awareness, education and tools to navigate their way in a changing society and to resolve the antagonisms that life inevitably throws up without resource to violence against each other or the nation's children. We dream that one day Irish society will devise a social contract that puts violence against women and children in all its forms outside the pale of what is acceptable. Where women like Anna, in uh, my earlier story that I mentioned, will not have to put up with the bullying abuse, with marital rape and fear that she has now been exposed to. And we dream of a healthier society with less abuse of power and less societal tolerance for abuse of power in the personal, fa familial, community, social and political domains of life. We simply must demand as a people that we organise and regulate life on this island in a way that protects our children and the most vulnerable in society. In short, we have got to stop the abuse of power that lies at the heart of violence against women. This means confronting reality, confronting impunity and confronting cultural norms and behaviours. Just today in the newspaper, Colette Brown commented on an appalling episode down in Kerry where a priest at a funeral asked the people in the church to pray for a man who subsequently was convicted of sexual assault, serious sexual assault on a teenager. Now he has subsequently apologised, as has his bishop and other priests, but it is incredible incredible to think that that kind of thing 
still happens today in Ireland. And there wasn't a word of prayer for the survivor of these assaults. And the columnist, she said, rape culture does not persist because some men rape women. She said, it persists because the rest of us equivocate and find reasons to condone sexual violence. Mindful of this, I would like to finish with the words of former executive director of UN Women, Michelle Bachelet, which I think begins to capture the imperative, the energy and the actors that are needed, if perhaps not the structural transformation required. Speaking a few years ago, she made a rallying cry that applies in Ireland today as clearly as it does in any developing country. And she said, stopping violations of women's human rights is a moral imperative. Joining in the efforts to stop violence is everyone's responsibility. Government, private enterprise, civil society groups, communities and individual citizens can all make essential contributions. Men and boys must be active in encouraging respect for women and zero tolerance of violence. Cultural and religious leaders can send clear messages about the value of a world free of violence against women. Thank you very much. If I could go to the first gentleman, the statistics, um, there are statistics being taken, um, as I say, you know, there are annual statistics, all agencies take, collect statistics, but what we need is research, a longitudinal research, so that we can, you know, be um, more informed and a, a proper analysis can be done. I mean, that's why we need a second savvy. Savvy actually was the um, vehicle through which we could go to government and say, you know, we have this longitudinal research and this validates all the stories. But we do need a second savvy because things have changed in the meantime. For example, savvy told us that uh, 3%, only 3% of uh, victims were victims of chemical abuse. Now, I don't think that could be hugely different, but it will be diff somewhat different. And we need those kinds of, you know, those kinds of proper, as I say, information from longitudinal research. Um, in terms of power and the redistribution of power, I mean, I think that's up to all of us as individuals and how we manage that in our own relationships. Um, and I do think, and just to go jump to your um, uh, question about schools, I think. It's very sad when we hear from the um, inspectors of schools that the SPAG programme is not being delivered in secondary schools, which is very worrying. And that is a place where young people can explore about relationships, about power, and talk about these issues, because that's the best way that children will learn, is in discussion and being facilitated in discussion. Uh, but there is, the Rape Crisis Centre does do a very comprehensive um, addition to the SPHE programme is called Body Right, and it's on the website if you want to uh, look at that. Um, and I, I think uh, your reference to um, uh, the lady who referred to that men have to be part of the solution, you're absolutely right about that. And I think uh, Don't Be That Guy is one of those uh, other awareness raising programmes that are awareness raising, yes, programmes that we've been involved with. And there's also the white women movement, which I think is, uh, again, about getting men uh, involved in the elimination of violence against women. Um, there was, uh, um, oh yes, uh, somebody said that they didn't think that young people knew even about you know, the violence that was happening. And it, again, there was a worrying piece of research done by the Union of Students of Ireland called Say Something recently. And in that particular research, uh, we learned that some of the people who had been victims of serious uh, sexual assault didn't know that it was a crime. And they didn't know where to go for help. So, you know, they're, they're in, we have a lot to do. We're very close to it in the Dublin Rape Crisis Centre. We think that everybody knows at one level and uh, you keep on repeating, repeating the same mantra and you kind of feel, gosh, should people be sick hearing about this? But actually, 
we have to keep on repeating the same thing because people don't know. And I think it, it really behoves of us as a society to put pressure on education in particular to, uh, uh, because it is about prevention and it is about education, education, education. I think I've covered all. I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of time and of the promise of a glass of wine for you, but there'll be a chance to continue the conversation in, in the front room. Before I conclude, just I want to give thanks to, to Sylvia, to Lisa and Tom and others in the task team, uh, to Paula on the camera, um, but most of all to, to Ellen for agreeing to, to do the annual lecture. I know that she put a lot of, a lot of thought and a lot of work into it. So if you'd like to just join me again in thanking Ellen for tonight's lecture. Thank you.